can be found in your pew Bibles on page 652 of the Old Testament. You may follow along if you wish. Again, that's Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9, page 652 of the Old Testament. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheep that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Our New Testament passage is from the book of Mark, uh, for chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Uh, you can find that on your pew Bible uh, in, on pages 54 through 55 of the New Testament. Um, I'm going to be reading from a slightly different translation, but uh, you should still be able to follow along just fine if, if you'd like to do that. Um, just a word about this passage as we as we go to it. Uh, Mark, if you are looking at your Bible, um, the end of Mark is a little interesting. Uh, after verse 8, most Bibles have some sort of brackets and some verses after that. Um, just a note on that, the uh, scholars uh, used to think that Mark went a little longer than it did, and then they discovered uh, some more accurate and earlier manuscripts of Mark that they did at verse 8, um, which is why we're reading uh, verses 1 through 8 this morning. We're going to hear, hear the Gospel of Mark as Mark wrote it um, originally. And as we do that, let us let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you are so good. We give you thanks and praise that we are here this morning, that you have called each and every one of us to celebrate and rejoice. Christ is risen. Lord, as we open up the scripture this morning, as we read it, and as we meditate on, on it, Lord, I pray that your spirit would be here, that it would be in this place, that it would be within us, and that these words might draw us all closer to you. In Christ's name, amen. So Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought, bought spices, so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. You know, one of um, one of my favorite movies as a kid, uh, and it still is one of my favorite movies, is, is that great 1985 epic, Back to the Future. If you're not familiar with this great American story, Back to the Future is it's the story of a teenager named Marty McFly who has a scientist friend named Doc Brown. And Doc Brown invents a time machine out of all things a DeLorean sports car. 
Well, Marty ends up accidentally going back in time to when his parents were teenagers. And as you can imagine, all kinds of crazy stuff happens with that. Well, Marty has to figure out how to get back to 1985 where he belongs, and um, throughout a lot of comic events, he finally does. And at the very end of the movie, he's back in 1985, and suddenly Doc Brown shows up again with the time machine and tells Marty that he has to come with him to the future, because in the future, there's some problems with Marty's future kids. And so Marty gets into the DeLorean time machine, it rises up off the ground, and takes off and comes flying straight at you, straight into the screen, and then suddenly it disappears. And it's replaced with the words, to be continued. And that's the end of the movie. Now, I remember watching this as a kid, and we had it on videotape, and me and my friends would watch this over and over. We watched it a lot. Uh, probably not as often as we watched Star Wars, but we still watch Back to the Future a lot. And I remember every single time those words, to be continued, showed up on the screen, I remember thinking, well, come on already. Continue. Back to the Future came out in 1985, and it wasn't until 1989 that that promised sequel came out. The first movie ended with Marty heading off into this unknown future, and then it left us hanging there for four years. Four years without a resolution. Four years of wondering, what's going to happen? Well, that's a long time, especially if you're a kid. In fact, I remember one time, I remember this real clear. It was a snow day in 1988. We were off from school. Me and my friends had all been outside playing all morning, and when we got cold and wet and tired, we, we went back to my house. It was me and about four of my friends. And my sister also had some friends over, and we all decided to watch Back to the Future. So we did. Sure enough, at the end, it was to be continued. We just couldn't take it anymore. We had to know what was going to happen. We had to know what happened to Marty and his kids in the future. And if the movie people weren't going to tell us, we decided that we would do something about it. You see, we don't like to be left hanging like this, do we? We want resolution. We want everything to tie up nice and neat in the end, so that when it's over, we can move on, we can go on our way, we can go about our daily business. And so when things are left unresolved like this, when they're left unfinished, we get in uncomfortable. And I think that's why we don't actually often look at Mark's Easter story. Did you notice how there is no nice, tidy ending here? Everything is just left hanging. There's no real resolution. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, they get up early on Sunday to go anoint the body of Jesus. And they're probably not just mourning the loss of their friends, but they're also, I imagine, feeling defeated. Their hopes about what the future would look like had seemed to die with Jesus on that Friday. So I can only imagine how completely distraught they are over what has just happened over the past couple of days. So much so that they get up and they go to anoint the body without apparently without even thinking about the fact that there's a big, gigantic stone in the way that's closing off the tomb. And so it's only just before that they get there that that thought occurs to them, and they, they start to, to mutter to each other, wait, wait a second, who's going to roll away that stone? How are we even going to get in there to annoy the body? But then they look up, wait a second, it's already been rolled back. They go in, still expecting to find the body of their friend and their teacher and their leader. But it's not there. Instead, there's a young man dressed in dazzling white, just sitting there. And this completely alarms them, which, to be honest, seems like a perfectly reasonable response to me. And this young man says what angels always say throughout the Bible, do not be alarmed, don't be afraid. And he goes on to explain that Jesus, the one who was crucified, the one who was dead, he has risen. He is not here. Yes, you've got the right place. This is where he was. 
See, here's where his body was laid. This is not where he is now. He has risen. He is not here. In fact, he's gone on. He's going before you back to Galilee. So go tell all the disciples, even Peter, even the one who denied him three times, go tell them all that he is going before you. So go. Go meet him in Galilee. And so having seen and heard this, here we go. We're all set for the big finale, the big resolution. Everything is going to come together now. These three women, the only three, mind you, the only three people who haven't completely abandoned Jesus by this point. They are told to go and tell that Jesus has risen. And so what do they do? And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. What? Are you kidding me? That's it? That's how Mark's gospel ends? He ends his account of the good news of Jesus with this? What kind of ending is this? It's just hanging there, unresolved, unfinished. The last of Jesus' followers who hadn't betrayed or denied or otherwise left him, now even they are running. And the last words that Mark gives us on the subject is that they were afraid, so they said nothing to anyone. Could there be a more unsettling ending than this? And what's really ironic is that when you read through all 16 chapters of Mark, Jesus is constantly telling people to, to not tell others about him. And they do it anyway. They go tell everybody. Now here at the empty tomb, people are finally told, go, tell. And they say nothing to anyone. Don't you just want to grab Mark like I wanted to grab the writers of Back to the Future? What kind of Easter message is this? Tell us how it ends. We have an empty tomb. But where is Jesus right now? He's risen, but now what? And why? Why won't the Marys and Salome, why won't they tell someone? Mark, come on, give us some resolution here, please. Well, when my friends and I decided back on that snow day sometime in the late 1980s, we decided that we couldn't take that to be continued, the end of Back to the Future anymore. When we got to the point where we could not deal with it just being there, unresolved, we decided that if the movie people weren't going to fill us in, then we would do it ourselves. So we got my dad's video camera, and we ran around the house, and we found things that we thought would make good props for a movie about going into the future. And we spent the rest of the afternoon making our own Back to the Future sequel. Thankfully, I think that video has been lost, so I don't have it to show you today. But we were so unsettled by this cliffhanger at the end of the movie that our only recourse was to finally put ourselves in that story and for us to go and tell what happened. Now we know, obviously, that at some point these two Marys and Salome, they told about the empty tomb. We know they did, or else we wouldn't be here this morning. Mark ends his gospel account before that happens. He ends with a command and a promise that are just left hanging there, unresolved and unfinished. Jesus, the one who was crucified, the one who was laid here in this tomb, he is not here. He is risen. Now go tell his disciples. Go tell Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. To Galilee. Your home before all of this happened. Jesus has risen. And he is going to meet you there, the place of your daily routines. Galilee, the place that was the intersection of commerce and society and religion of Jewish culture and Gentile culture. Jesus has risen, and that is where he has gone ahead to meet you. Mark's telling of the story of Jesus ends with this unresolved command, just hanging there. Go and tell. But you see, it's not just a command. Even more than that, 
It's a promise. Go and tell, and he will meet you there. And so even if Mark leaves us with this unfinished account, we're left wondering. You see, if everything were tied up nice and neat in the end, we could maybe take it out once a year, dust it off every Easter and then, and then leave it alone. Put it away and be done with it for a while. It's not. It's left unresolved. It's left unfinished. So we can't put it away just yet. What Mark, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what he's getting us to realize is that this is a story that is left unfinished for us, for you, and for me, for everyone who hears it. This is not a story that we can just put away quite yet. Jesus has risen, so go, tell. And if Mark's not going to give us the ending, then maybe our only recourse is to put ourselves in the story and for us to go and tell. And here is the promise of Easter. The tomb is empty. Jesus is not there. He has risen. He has gone ahead so that he can meet you. There is no place you can go where he will not be there to meet you. And what's more, for those of us who come to Easter not quite sure of what's going on, for those of us who come with fears, who come with a weak, trembling faith, for those of us who come wondering something this astonishing could actually be true, struggling to believe, maybe, maybe wondering if we could even dare to believe something like this. Or for those of us who come feeling defeated by the events of the past week, or month, or year. Well, for those of us who come like that, we come to this empty tomb good company. Because these were the types of people that came on that first Easter morning. Defeated, unsure, incredulous, fearful, and trembling. But they came. Like we have come this morning. And they were given the honor of going out and preaching the first Christian sermon. Jesus has risen. Sure, they faltered. They even ran trembling. They let fear silence them for a while. But we are here this morning telling the same story of the empty tomb. And that means that the risen Jesus met them anyway. Even when we struggle to understand, even when we feel all has been lost, even when we are unsure of the outcome, even when we are afraid, Jesus, the one who was crucified but who is now risen, he yet goes before you calling you to meet him in Galilee, to meet him in all of those places where you live your life, not just here on Easter morning, but in your home, in your school, in your work, in your neighborhood. Even in your fears and your doubts, in your successes and your failures, he has promised to meet you. Family, the tomb is empty. Jesus has risen. And so there is nothing that he cannot overcome and redeem. And this is not a story so easily put back on the shelf. So let us not be silent. Let us go. Let us tell the good news that he is not there in the tomb. He has risen. And he calls and invites each and every one of us into the story of his resurrected life, into the telling of that story. Family, Jesus has risen. Hallelujah. He has risen indeed. Amen.